Up next is proteins. All right, so proteins are macromolecules that form the foundation of so much in your cell. They're involved in almost every aspect of cellular function from providing structure to catalyzing enzyme reactions. Uh, so let's take a look in more detail. So proteins are, they're complex molecules made up of amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks. They're the monomer, the single unit of proteins. There are 20 different types commonly found in nature, but there are many, many other amino acids. It's just, they aren't all found in living organisms. Um, these amino acids are linked together in a specific sequence, forming something called a polypeptide chain. Uh, the sequence of the amino acid determines a protein's unique shape, which in turn determines its function. Uh, this is incredibly important, and we'll be talking about it actually quite a bit, various times throughout the semester. All right, so a little bit into the function here. So we've got enzymes. Um, all enzymes are proteins, but not all proteins are enzymes. It's one of those little things. Um, many proteins act as enzymes, which are just biological, uh, good way to think of it, like little, almost like little machines, like they activate things. Uh, it's an enzyme. Enzyme causes something to happen. Um, they can speed up chemical reactions. Um, they're crucial for things like digestion, metabolism, uh, DNA replication. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, lactase earlier, right? It's an enzyme, so a little protein, that its job is to break lactose, right? So break the galactose away from the glucose molecule of, of lactose. Um, all right, hormones are another function. Uh, hormones are chemical signaling molecules that are usually proteins. They can also be steroids, um, or rather, usually they are proteins or steroids. Um, there are a few other exceptions to that. Um, some actual indivi individual amino acids can function as a hormone. Um, hormones are responsible for regulating uh, physiological processes, including uh, growth, development, metabolism, reproduction, you know, kind of same list we keep coming up against, right? Um, an example of protein hormone is insulin. It's a really important one, right, for maintaining uh, appropriate blood glucose levels. In type one diabetes, um, you, don't produce, uh, or rather your cells that produce insulin get damaged. Uh, and so you can't produce insulin on your own. It's an autoimmune disorder. In type two diabetes, your insulin receptors become insensitive. They can't react to the insulin hormone the way they're supposed to. And there's some really cool medications out now that can fix, fix uh, mitigate that. All right, uh, another function um, is structural support. Proteins provide support to the cells and tissues. Um, for example, the protein collagen is a major component of connective tissues in tendons and cartilage. Uh, you probably have seen a lot of advertisements for collagen supplements lately. Um, people buy lotions that have collagen in it, hoping that it'll make their skin uh, look younger because collagen is something that you start producing less of as you get older. Um, and then transport is another function. So. Uh, proteins can act as carriers, um, facilitating transport, <laughs> we're gonna talk about this a lot more, um, across cell membranes, because remember we mentioned cell membranes are, um, there's parts that like water and parts that don't like water. Most proteins, uh, depends, but tend to be, um, they can have hydrophobic parts and hydrophilic parts, and it, they have to be able to get through that membrane, and if you're completely a very hydro Philic protein, you're not going to be able to just pass through. You've got to have a way to do that. So there are other proteins that can form channels and things. Um, hemoglobin that carries iron in your red blood cells uh, is a protein. And we're actually going to use it as an example a little bit later um, when we look at what can go wrong if your protein doesn't fold properly. Uh, defense, so antibodies, right? Those are proteins. Uh, they play an incredibly important role in the adaptive immune system, right? Recognizing and neutralizing foreign invaders like bacteria and viruses. Um, and then finally, communication. Some proteins like hormones um, transmit signals between cells and regulate uh, a whole range of physiological processes. Um, uh, we also, uh, we won't get to talk about it much in here, um, but when you look at like uh, neurotransmission, there are important proteins involved there, um, neurotransmitters. Um, some of which are, are proteins. Okay, onward. So um, proteins have 
different shapes and molecular weights. So you can have very, very large proteins or large protein complexes with multiple proteins connected to each other. Um, or you can have long, like fibrous proteins, like, oops, like collagen um, that forms these kind of long chains. Um, protein structure is really, really critical to its function. Uh, so if a protein doesn't fold properly, it can't perform its job properly. This becomes important. We're going to, oh, I think we'll get to see a little tiny bit of it if you're taking the lab. Uh, changes in temperature impact uh, protein structure. Um, pH, exposure to certain chemicals, um, can cause changes in protein shape. We call this uh, denaturation. Okay. Um, all proteins are made up of different arrangements of the same 20 amino acids mentioned a minute ago. So amino acids are the monomers that make up proteins. Um, each amino acid consists of a central carbon atom. I'll grab my little highlighter. So that central carbon atom, see each of them has that. And bound to that central carbon atom, we're going to have an amino group, amino group, that's uh, an NH2. So there we go right there, NH2. And then also a carboxyl group. That's going to be your COOH carboxyl group. You see it there. And then uh, an additional hydrogen. In that fourth space, all right, so that we can maintain our octet rule, remember our, from our earlier sections, um, we're gonna have what's called an R group. Each amino acid has a unique R group, okay? So that is the only difference between the 20 amino acids. They all have that central carbon with an amino group, a carboxylic group, and a um, hydrogen atom. And in that R group space, there's a range of different things that might be there from just a single just a single hydrogen like we see in alanine um, to you know all these other different options. And this doesn't even show there are some that have uh, complex rings as well. They have this huge range. All right, so like I've already mentioned, right, the sequence and number of amino acids ultimately determine a protein's size, shape, and therefore its function. Um, so each amino acid is attached to another amino acid. It's forming, they form these chains. It's a covalent bond known as a peptide bond. Uh, and it's formed, again, by a dehydration reaction. And we'll, we'll actually look at those reactions in a later chapter, but just, just a little bit. Um, the term polypeptide is used to refer to a chain, a polymer of amino acids. So poly, many, peptides. Peptide is another word for amino acids. Um, even one amino acid being wrong. So as, as you're forming your amino acid, right, we'll it's later, but we'll talk a lot about um, how we go from DNA to a protein. If one thing gets translated as the word wrong, we end up with a protein who may have uh, the wrong shape, the wrong function. A really, I hate to call it good, but a very straightforward example of that is actually in sickle cell anemia. It has what's called a single point change. And one, one amino acid is different, but that one change causes your hemoglobin to fold wrong. And you end up with these cells, these red blood cells that are sickle shaped because the hemoglobin isn't the right shape. And so then they block up places and arteries and lead to a whole huge range of downstream consequences. Uh, if you've ever known anybody with sickle cell disease, then you know it can be extreme. Uh, What's really cool is uh, something called CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9, actually. Uh, we've been able to actually treat people and fix, fix that mistake in their DNA code. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, if you're taking my class and not just watching this on YouTube, uh, I'll post uh, a link to a really neat little story about the very first woman to have this gene therapy treatment. Uh, all right, so off we go. Uh, so that takes us a little more deeply into protein structure. So let's let's talk about it a bit more because it's not just a single chain that then forms this shape. There's a process to it. Uh, first is going to be the primary structure. This is the linear sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. All right, so that's this first guy here. It's just, just the chain of amino acids. And the specific order is encoded by your DNA. The secondary structure here uh, is where we're going to have the proteins fold into kind of repeating patterns. The um, most common ones are alpha helices, uh, as shown here, and then beta pleated sheets, as we see here. Um, those helices and sheets can then interact with each other uh, 
to form the tertiary structure. Um, and this results in interactions between amino acids located in different parts of the sequence. So you can see from this picture, right, that you have amino acids from very different parts of the you know, original chain can interact with each other through hydrogen bonding primarily, but also sometimes like some disulfide bonding. Uh, and then finally, we can end up with a quaternary structure, that fourth level, which is where we actually see multiple different proteins interacting with each other. It can be um, multiple subunits of the same protein. Uh, so you could have like two or three of the same protein bound together, or it can be two or more different proteins that are then connected to each other. Um, that quaternary structure influences the protein's final function and its stability as well. So each protein has its own unique sequence and shape, changes in temperature and pH, exposure to chemicals can change that, right? We kind of mentioned that before, kind of reiterate that. Um, being denatured is often reversible, but not always reversible. All right, so you could have a protein, especially like say it misfolds, there are special other proteins in your cells that will go and check it. And if it's not folded right, it'll unfold it and try to get it to fold again. We call them chaperones. You don't need to know about that yet. But, but we can also have where the denaturation process uh, can't be reversed. Think cooking eggs. Um, egg whites are primarily a protein called albumin. And uh, it once you heat it up, uh, it doesn't go back. <laughs> you can't take a cooked egg and make it an uncooked egg, right? Uh, now, not all proteins will denature at high temperatures. That just depends on the protein's uh, structure and type of bonds. There are bacteria that can survive in hot springs. Um, they have proteins that are adapted to function at these really high temperatures.